I love it. I love it. Well, welcome everybody who's streaming on. We're going to give it maybe one more minute and then uh, we're, we'll get started. But we're, I'm just chatting with uh, my friend Leanne Davey about her strategy week. If you don't follow Leanne on LinkedIn, you should check it out because she's dropping some really great tri tips on strategy. And I actually think that's probably like the number one leadership competency that we get asked about. I think about like the number of times I'm doing alignment meetings with managers and they, they'll say, oh, we need them to have a more of a strategic view. And I think people don't know, like the way you've just talked about it, like how yeah. to break it down. What does that mean? It's like saying, take your medicine. What medicine? Yeah, exactly. So it, that's what's been really fun. It, I, I did a post somewhere during strategy month about you know, you've probably been given this feedback from a 360 feedback or you didn't yeah. get a promotion and they tell you you weren't strategic enough. But my experience is that when the person then says back to HR or their leader, okay, well, what, what does it look like to be more strategic? They get a lot of like, uh, well, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I actually did, uh, and I had written an article for HBR on this a long time ago on what are the three aspects of being strategic. And so mm -hmm. I've, I've been trying to be more practical for people because we throw this word around oh. all the time, but, um, so I actually, you know, every week there's been exercises that people can download and, and, you know, getting, um, tangible and tactical. Yeah, no, I think your tips are amazing because it does a ton of, it breaks down like a really crazy concept and makes it super um, applicable and actionable, which, you know, we're big fans of at the round table. That's for sure. Well, it's All important. I said, I, I'm going to do 30 days of strategy, never needing either an MBA or to wear a suit. And so <laughs> I'm like, we're taking strategy down off its lofty perch because, uh, you know, I think it's been so closely held and, yeah. and treated as, you know, if you don't work for McKinsey, you can't be strategic. And it's like, yeah. no, I don't have an MBA. I'm a psychology person. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I haven't worn a suit a single day. I, I haven't had a waistband on my pants for a single day <laughs> and I've still been able to be strategic. So. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's get into today's conversation. So hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I am Glyne Like Shine Roberts McCabe. I have a, one of my coaches told me I need to use like a harder hitting thing. He said I should use, it's not Glyne like pain, it's Glyne like spine. But I kind of oh. like Glyne like shine instead of Glyne like brain. You know what? I still, when I say your name every single time, years after having met you, I still say Glyne like shine. <laughs> and it, it was like, um, I, met a, I had a woman in graduate school and she introduced herself on the first day and she said, hi, I'm Anna Pargana. And she paused for a moment and she said, I apologize for the fact you'll be singing my name in the shower. And that was uh, 1993. Okay. <laughs> I'm still okay. singing. Still singing. <laughs> Anna Pargan, a fee five Pargan. Yeah. So I love it. Works. <laughs> well, we are here with Leanne Davy, who, as you can see, is a ball of energy. And um, I'm super excited to talk to you today about team things. And the title of today's session is Grow Up, Get Along, and Get Stuff Done, which is from your, it's the subtitle of your book, uh, The Good Fight. So we're going to get into that in a minute. But um, just to remind everybody, we are going to have the lines muted, but use the chat. And I always say, the Ask the Expert series was Clubhouse before Clubhouse. So this is where you get to ask Leanne whatever questions on your mind. I mean, I, I know Leanne. I can call Leanne anytime and ask her questions uh, before she starts charging me. Um, <laughs> But we do have a few to get us going, um, but throw them in the chat, throw them in the Q&A. Uh, we are going to talk a lot today about teams and culture and, um, you know, the one of Leanne's favorite topics, conflict. But let's kind of set the stage. Um, tell us a bit about the work that you do in the area of teams and why teams, what, you know, what do you love about it? What you got, what got you involved in this space in particular? Yeah, so let me talk about... Uh two different centering points. So my first centering point is for my life in general and my career. And it comes from many, many years ago when my kids were little and my mother-in-law was here helping out. It was fantastic. And she's got the kids. I'm getting ready to rush out the door to a meeting. And I come down to say, kiss my kids goodbye. And my mother-in-law says, poor mummy has to go to work. Oh, And I just like I just stopped dead in my tracks. Wow. Right? I'm like, oh. wow. um, and I just said, lucky mummy gets to go to work. But as I thought about it, the experience of work for my mother-in-law 
and for her husband and for, you know, just their generation was that, you know, work is something you have to do. You put up with it for 40 right. years until you can retire. Yeah. And so for me, kind of in that moment, it became, no, my mission is to make work a more meaningful, wonderful contribution to people's lives. Mm. So that's where I came from. And then when we founded Three Co's, we actually came up with a mission statement before the company even had a name. We knew what we wanted to do. And it was uh, to help people achieve amazing things together. Mm -hmm. So meaningful work at a high level for me personally, but that as an organization, our focus is not on that individual performance, not on, it's really on what we can do when we come together. And so the start of the mission statement is transforming the way people communicate, connect and contribute so they can mm -hmm. achieve things together. And that's where three co's comes from, <laughs> communicate, connect and contribute. And so uh, that's at the center of our Venn diagram. Yeah. And the, the three pieces that kind of go around it are uh, helping people chart their strategy, helping executive teams have the dynamic and the alignment they need to execute it. And then mobilizing the top couple of layers of leaders. And mm -hmm. that is one heck of a fun and meaningful way to spend your career. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. And I, I really loved um, your book. I thought it was such a great kind of a uh, challenge to the notion that we have about conflict being bad um, and that, you know, in teams and in organizations, we need to, have, you know, kind of avoid it at all costs, right? And so talk, mm -hmm. tell me about that, because I think that's, that book um, is one that I always say to people, you got to pick it up, you've got to read it, because um, we get so we, we, we get so sort of into the mindset around, um, you know, avoidance or, uh, you know, the, the idea that we're, we need to kind of keep the, the surface smooth. And yet so many great things happen from conflict. So tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah. So of course, you know, like many, 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 many authors, the reason I wrote this book is because I needed to read it mm. and nobody else had written it. So. <laughs> And, and that's just the truth. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a highly conflict uh, avoidant person, conflict averse for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm sure there's yeah. lots of people putting yeah. up their hands in their own um, office. My husband might disagree with that. Okay. But I would say I have certain kinds of conflict that I'm avoidant over and then others that I have no problem getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, funny that he'd be the one to be able to <laughs> differentiate. Um, so uh, I think really early in my career, I got into my very first job. Uh, I became a manager pretty young and got trapped working for a boss that was not a great boss. And mm -hmm. I didn't have any conflict skills. I didn't know how to advocate for my team. I didn't know how to let my boss know that she was behaving in a way that wasn't working for me or anybody else. And I ended up uh, just quitting, figuring mm. I just, I didn't know what to do. And so I was so careful when I was, you know, looking for my next place to go. And I interviewed like nine interviews at the next company I went to, to make sure that I had found the company that doesn't have conflict. So <laughs> smart girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And of course, a couple of years later, this massive conflict kind of erupted. And I realized that, you know, conflict is inevitable. Um, it's natural. It's normal. And I was going to have to learn how to make it productive because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that I could find some place where there wasn't going to be conflict. Mm -hmm. So the, my work from that point on has really focused on the, the healthy side of conflict. It's worked on a few topics, like how do we get away from conflict as an event and mm. start creating conflict as a habit? So let's not think about conflict as a root canal. Let's think about conflict as flossing. Um, mm. So all of my work has kind of led to that. And, and then it was time to put 10 years worth of practice and ideas into a book and uh, the good fight was born. Yeah, I love it. Conflict is a habit. Tell me about that curious. I think a lot of the models of conflict we have make conflict an event. Yeah. So if you think about the great stuff around difficult conversations, fierce mm -hmm. conversations, mm -hmm. crucial mm -hmm. conversations, all those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all around the conversation, the event yeah. that yeah. is conflict. 
And if conflict is an event, then there's lots of time to fret about it, to get sweaty palms and butterflies in your stomach and to tell yourself all sorts of stories that usually aren't true, et cetera, et cetera. And then to do the replay and the Monday quarterbacking yeah. and everything. And so conflict as an event to me just seemed like too high a hurdle. And what, what I was seeing was that I was consulting in organizations that had spent huge amounts of money putting all of their people through these programs. Mm -hmm. And I think the programs are good. I had no question, no uh, qualms about the programs. But what I noticed is no one was using the skills. Right. Like, okay, that's nice that you've all had radical candor training. I'm not yes. seeing, I'm not <laughs> even seeing tepid <laughs> candor. Forget radical oh, candor. I'm having this conversation with one of my clients right now. Exactly. Yeah. So the good fight went in two directions. So if we start with that in the middle, I went in two directions. I said, I think there's two things we have to solve for. One is we need to solve for both the fact that as humans, we're biologically wired to get along with our in-group and then we're socialized to uh, believe that conflict is a bad thing. So we have yeah. to go backwards. And so it's great that we can build a skill set. But, you know, doesn't mean we're ever going to take the hammer out of the toolbox if yeah. we think that hammering something is too mean for the nail. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. we got to go back to the mindset first. And then we got to go the other way, which is the flossing idea, which is we have to neutralize and normalize conflict, get away mm. from it as an event and just make productive tension something we're doing all day, every day. Mm. Um, so those are the two directions I went mm -hmm. from this sort of core of the event of conflict, which I think is failing us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so I, like, I'm curious, because as we're talking right now, because people might be watching this replay when it, you know, hits a gazillion views on YouTube um, in the future, but right now we're in a pandemic. And I'm kind of curious in terms of if you've noticed how conflict is uh, has changed at all within organizations as a result of a lot of people working from home. Uh, you know, have you noticed any differences in terms of how conflict is bubbling up for for us yeah. these days? So what was interesting is we had the early phase of the pandemic, which was a crisis. And yeah. in the crisis, conflict just went away because, yes. and actually in my first book, You First, I talk about teams that become crisis junkies because uh, when we have crises, we don't have to do much of the hard work of teamwork mm. um, because it's easier to get aligned. Right. There's no politics. There's no, yeah. media, there's lots of resources. So I think people enjoyed the first couple of months of the pandemic um, enjoyed, enjoyed. Um, yeah. But there was that crisis. And so yeah. all the meaningless stuff fell away. Yeah. So there just wasn't really yeah. conflict. Yeah. Yeah. But then we got back to, okay, this is going to be uh, how we're operating for a protracted period of time. Mm. And then we got into this really dangerous phase where I think our norms around conflict are that we only have those difficult conversations in person. Right. And so people were just not talking about things, not broaching issues that needed to be discussed. And that's when we get into what I call conflict debt where yeah. there are issues that we should be addressing that start to pile up. Mm -hmm. And when we get into conflict debt, the compounding interest on that debt is so costly. So if oh, I've man. had an interaction on a Zoom call and I'm noticing one of my team members, you know, when I started to present, they turned their camera off. Mm -hmm. And I tell myself this whole story about, oh, sure, you were there for Bob's presentation. But once I started presenting, <laughs> we're interested in, right? Yeah, I yeah. have no clue. It, it might be, I was on a call yesterday with someone who was nursing a baby. It's like, yeah. yeah, maybe you just don't want to nurse the baby with the camera. Yeah. Like who, who knows, but yeah. we make up all these stories. Well, sure. the problem is that's the initial debt we get into is not saying, Hey, you know, what was going on on the call? I'm kind of telling myself a story that you weren't interested, but I wanted to check in with you instead of that we kind of make up the story in our head. And then the next email that comes in from that person, mm -hmm. we just read it with a slightly different narrator or the narrator's yeah. got a bit more edge. And then we start to, have you ever had this experience where you have a, a bad dream where somebody behaves poorly in your dream and then you're mad at them the next day? <laughs> I find that's kind of how kind of how we are. We've created this whole story. Yeah. In our head yeah. It's the mental modeling, right? right? Like I'm going up the ladder and I've got this conclusion. 
Right. And so like just to go up in the ladder. I read your email has me now acting snotty toward you. And then you're like, well, Leanne's acting snotty today. And now you have justification to, so the whole thing goes south. So I think some people are still in that phase Mm -hmm. of, of not wanting to have the difficult conversations remotely. And therefore there's a lot of conflict debt building up. Mm -hmm. And I've seen particularly in situations where some people have to go into the office. Some people don't, uh, where there's this animosity, um, and it's, uh, resentment across people. And then I think the phase we're starting to get into for more and more people now is realizing that, okay, we can have hard conversations remotely. Mm -hmm. And I did a YouTube video about it because in some ways having conflict remotely has a few benefits. You can prepare better. You can have like a cheat sheet in front of you. You Mm -hmm. have a little physical distance that creates a little bit of emotional safety in a hard conversation. So I think we're now coming through into the phase where we're going to learn that, no, we can have conflict uh, virtually, just like we've learned to do everything else virtually. But if you're stuck in the phase of thinking that I need to not say anything because we're virtual, uh, you need to, you need to think differently because those interest payments are building up every day you let it go with resentment kind of bubbling. Yeah, I love that. I love that expression. I hadn't heard that expression conflict debt before. And I think about my own pattern and um, it's something that I've been working on for quite some time now, whereas I will accumulate the debt. And then, and then what happens is I just get really frustrated and it comes on like a hammer, right? That's my pattern. And I know I was noticing the pattern of avoiding and it's usually uh, what I avoid is when I don't avoid business issues. I'm super direct on business issues. It's more the personal side, right? As soon as it starts to feel where I have to be vulnerable, like you hurt my feelings or you did something that upset me or that type of thing, then I I kind of let it all sort of build up. And I think the, and and I think your point is so, is so important that, um, and I, and I think, you know, our brains are so Velcro-y for negative thoughts, right? So we get the email or we see that sign in a meeting and immediately we, we don't go to a positive. We always go to, there's something wrong with me or there's something that this person doesn't like about me. Or, and so I think all that self-awareness of knowing, even stopping and pausing within yourself to say, okay, what is happening right now? Right. What is the story? Right. I love Brene Brown says, what's the story me too. I'm telling myself? Brene Brown's right. line for that to me is the one that just really works, right? Because yeah. it's so true true. What, what story am I telling myself? And you can imagine it with the little characters drawn out, however you're picturing them. Um, but it really is a story that you're telling yourself Yeah. and it is not truth. It is not reality. It is not objective. And the more you can peel back to what is objective and then from there, ask questions and be curious, the better off you'll be. Yeah. And I think there's whole stories that we tell ourselves. And, and I think one of the things that we've been noticing, and I know you wrote an article on LinkedIn that got a ton of hits about, you know, um, I think with, uh, I'm trying to remember the thing, but it was like the idea that do I have to be a therapist as a manager, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because I find there's a lot of emotional stuff that's going on right now. We're trying to meet people where they are. We've been told repeatedly since the start of the pandemic, oh, we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. At the start of the call, before the call, you and I were talking about the Adam Grant article that's going around about the feeling being languishing right now. Um, But I'm curious, you know, as as you know, I'm sure there's leaders that are sitting and listening on this call that are feeling overwhelmed by a lot of the, you know, emotional support that they're needing to put out there and, and, you know, trying to be everything to everybody. What kind of, you know, thoughts or advice uh, would you share to help people navigate through all of this emotion that we're feeling? Yeah. So the first thing is, you know, let's answer the, the article uh, title, which is, does Mm -hmm. a manager have to be a therapist? And the answer is no. And a manager (laughs) shouldn't try to be a therapist. It's not your role. And if somebody needs therapy, um, you know, get them to an employee assistance program, get them to an online um, resource, but don't try and be someone's therapist. So that's the the short answer. What I think you do need to do is you need to hold space for emotion in the workplace. And Mm -hmm. I thought that before the pandemic, I will Mm -hmm. think it after the pandemic and I will underline it and write it in bold during the pandemic. So it's 
simply as you're starting to notice something saying, I'm noticing that, uh, you know, that my interactions with you are different. I'm noticing the way you present your ideas is different. You know, is it okay if we, you know, chat for a few minutes about where you're at? Um, so getting permission to talk with them about it and mm-hmm. then just holding space for it. What, what are you experiencing? Where are you at? And I like I like really generic questions like, where are you at? Because uh-huh. it, it allows the person to judge the safety in the moment, judge their comfort with being yeah. vulnerable. And it may be that they can answer, where are you at with, well, I have too much going on and something relatively safe, uh-huh. or they can tell you something much more profound. And, but, a, but a projective question like that is going to leave them in control of how they answer. So just, you know, where are you at is a useful question. Mm -hmm. And then just make the space for it to be okay to have this Mm -hmm. conversation. But the challenge is so many managers then jump in trying to solve things. (laughs) And if you try and solve, first of all, you likely don't have enough information because they probably haven't told you the whole truth the first time. Yeah. And so you're going to come out with something that isn't really accurate. You're going to be feeling great about yourself. Look at me with my amazing solution. (laughs) You're going to feeling like invalidated and that you didn't get Mm -hmm. it. And it's just bad. Mm -hmm. So don't try and solve, just make the space for it. Um, You know, you can certainly, uh, you can Michael Bungay stay near them with, you know, how can I help and those sorts of questions. Those things are all really important. I think it's also a great opportunity if you are feeling similarly to say, you know, I just want you to know I'm you know, having my own struggles with this. Uh, This is something that we can all get through together. So there are ways to, to, as you let the person have sufficient time, as you kind of hold the space for the emotion to then get the sense from them of when they need a little bit of help to kind of create forward momentum, right? So Mm -hmm. what would help where my other favorite question, where from here, right? Where from here, um, So if you've just used where are you at and where from here, and those are the only two lines you say in a, in a 20 minute conversation with somebody, that's Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. What you're doing is saying, it's okay to have the space to talk about this. Now, what's interesting is I, I get a lot of people feeling like I don't have time. I don't have time for that. Well, and I always go through my head as I think of a lot of the leaders that, you know, like I work with leaders who are extremely results focused, Mm -hmm. right? And I think being intentional about slowing down and checking in with people, it's actually not in their wiring. Yeah, it's not. Um, And they're kidding themselves. And so Mm -hmm. if, if, so I have a speech I've been giving called change has changed. And it's about Mm -hmm. how the human brain, the neuropsychology of perpetual change versus this sort of event-based change we used to have. And so if you think you can Mm -hmm. manage performance without managing attention and managing anxiety, you are kidding yourself. So I think a lot of those people who think of themselves as drivers and um, they are driving people into the ground, like it is, it's not working. Mm -hmm. So you want to move back up the value chain, first manage people's attention. So if, if you can help to cope with overwhelm, yeah. And even languishing or any of these uh, characteristics that are not something clinical where they need actually do need help. Yeah. Um, getting them focused on, look, to me, this is the one thing I care about this week. Mm-hmm. So if, if all these other things are not done <laughs> to the standards you would love or not done at all, to me, this is the one thing I, I care most about this week or today, or can mm-hmm. you just work on this and send it to me when it's done? But if you can help zoom people in on just one thing to pay attention to, that's going to bring the attention in and bring the anxiety down. Yeah. When we get people in that you know, optimal zone of stress and anxiety, we'll get performance. So don't you worry, you'll get your performance, but you're not going to get it by pretending there's no emotion. You're not going to get it by driving harder. And in fact, the, the interesting paradoxical thing about making space for emotion is that it gets smaller than not bigger. So when we, when we don't make space for emotion, we either have it build, like you were talking mm-hmm. about, right? It builds and builds and builds and it's mm-hmm. explosive and mm-hmm. that really hurts productivity. 
or when we don't create a safe space where it, it goes underground and it becomes passive aggressive and that one person can knock out productivity for a whole team yeah. as that spreads. So the most efficient, effective, high productivity thing you can do is actually to make some space for that emotion give the person enough space to figure out their own answers and maybe just a little a little hand on the back to help them get moving forward. Mm -hmm. And it, you'll be amazed how then the drama takes up less time, not more. Because so yes. many of us put so much energy into stifling emotion. Yeah. <laughs> just like have a good cry and get on with it. Yeah. We would be much more productive. So I am seeing a lot of people make that mistake. Yeah. And uh and I really encourage you to remember first manage attention. That's the first thing you can do. And if you're less comfortable with the emotions, start by managing people's attention. Mm -hmm. Mostly prioritize, get down to one thing, take stuff off that they don't have to worry about. Then if that's not sufficient, then you're gonna have to manage their anxiety more directly. Mm -hmm. But if you manage those two things, the performance manages itself. It's amazing. And, and it is worth saying that if you have somebody who comes to you crying every day of the week, that's a performance issue and treat it like a performance issue. And that's, mm -hmm. that's okay. You're allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. and if you need help, get them help. But if it's, you know, I hear people say, but aren't people just being manipulative when they cry and they're just, I'm like, really, oh my God. really, really <laughs> think that people wow, you know, you've been watching too much reality television because yeah. that's not what happens in the workplace. So um, do manage it as a performance issue in the 5% of cases where it is a performance issue, but otherwise make enough space for it and you watch, it will get smaller, not bigger. Yeah, and I love this. I love what you said too about, uh, we had Trisha Nadef on a couple of weeks ago from Management Research Group and she was talking about with all of the uncertainty that we're in, that we continue to be in with COVID, there's still lots of, even though the vaccines are rolling out and people are getting their shots, there's still a lot of question marks going on yeah. and all of this uncertainty um, you know, she sort of had three big tips for leaders. And one was this whole idea of exactly what you said, ruthless prioritization, because our brains right now with the uncertainty can't handle anything, yeah. right? Like, yeah. like, and like long range planning, forget it, chunk it down, be ruthless with prioritization. And yet, you know, like, I think what, you know, um, and I'm curious to see what, uh, what you've been seeing and, and um, you know, what your sort of thoughts are on how leaders can get out of this trap. One of the things that we noticed, um, and I don't think it's gotten better, so is that as soon as we went to Zoom, everybody now is having their Zoom meeting, every meeting on a Zoom meeting. And in fact, managers that were used to sort of management by walking around and FaceTime management now are overcompensating by shoving all kinds of, you know, Zoom meetings in their calendars so that they're calendars, you know, it's the old uh, bar chart, right? Like you just look, all you see is meeting to meeting to meeting. And so, um, you know, and then when you, what does everybody complain about in organizations? Too many meetings, too many meetings. So when you think about, you know, the work that you've done and, and, you know, helping teams become more productive, more efficient, talk to me a little bit about meetings and, and how people can get a lot more ruthless. Like when you talk about ruthless prioritization, I think that's one of the most overlooked areas. Oh, yeah. Prioritization. Absolutely. Where do you actually need to? If you really need a meeting for this, so what? What would you say to that? Yeah. So absolutely. Uh, you know, we have the standing meeting, which somehow, <laughs> you know, once it gets standing, it plants its feet and never leaves. Uh, and. Uh, then we have all the ad hoc meetings that get. It's a disaster. Yeah. So, you know, first of all being able to not have to treat meetings as sacred cows, things that we can't right. ever question, right? So go back in, look at everything on your calendar and question it mm -hmm. and, and question it in many ways. Is the meeting itself, you know, does it deserve the space? Is it set up for success? Do we have the right people there? Is this a meeting that we end up just replicating with a different group later? If so, how do we do it more efficiently? So there's all of those questions. Then there's just participation. 
why am I going to this meeting? Does it need to be me? Do I have FOMO and yeah. I'm just afraid of not going to the meeting? Uh, is it that our communication practices suck? And so mm. I go to the meeting because it's the only reliable way of yeah. getting the information out. If so, how about we improve the communication instead of having more people going to meetings? So there's so much just in whether or not the meeting should be there. But I find people love a great meeting. It's just yeah. so few great meetings. So yeah. we can also think about how do we do a better job so we can, um, you know, do a better job of having more clarity around what, what is this agenda item on here for? Are we adding unique value in talking about things that we can only do together? Those kinds of topics. Have we had primer documents? And I am a huge advocate of primer documents for meetings. So primer isn't just here, I take the PowerPoint that I'm going to walk through in the session and send it out in advance, but it's actually a document made to prime the conversation we want to have. So it's got call outs and things that say, hey, on this slide, can you look at this versus this and come with some thoughts? And so it primes the conversation that makes the meeting much, much, much more effective and more valuable. The other big one is research is now showing that we're overdoing video. Right. And there's a huge amount of processing power required to try and your brain is trying to pick up cues from tiny little electronic heads. Mm. <laughs> and there's a lot of bandwidth being eaten up in our heads, trying to figure out, you know, who's paying attention, who likes yeah. this, who doesn't like this. So we want more situations where we're, we're on a call like this. We are sharing the screen so that we can all see the work and we can see somebody typing or working on a document or we're whiteboarding, but with only audio. Mm. So that we're hearing each other, but we're not wasting bandwidth on yeah. processing low fidelity um, video cues. So that's yeah. something. And then the final one that I'm really excited about is some research. I was building out a course on working remotely. And I found some really new research on a technique called communication bursts. And this is the one I'm most excited about. So communication burst is particularly great if you have a team in different time zones and <laughs> right, oh. kind of all over. Yeah. And what you do is you set a time and you can use as many of them in a week as you want. And you set the time and you say, this is, it's like a meeting, but it's not a meeting. So in this two hour phase, we're all going to be on task on a particular thing we're working on as a team. Uh -huh. And during that time, you can count on that. So first of all, you can email one another and get a response during that mm -hmm. time, as opposed to asynchronous, where normally we have to send an email and wait for it to cross the time zones and see if, you know, they respond. And yeah. So this way, no, we know if you need to talk to the team, you can message them, you can oh. email them. If you need to jump on with just two or three people and, and hash something out for 15 minutes, you can. And this idea of having something on the calendar where we're all going to be working, we're mostly working independently. We're, mm. we're mostly just making progress on our key deliverables, but we know that if we need something, everybody's on at the same time. We can get to anyone. We can solve things, make calls, move forward. And that communication burst concept to me is really attractive. <laughs> like just knowing we're all working at the same time. And, and if you want to start with a five minute huddle where at the beginning of the burst, you just say, okay, this is the burst. Here's where we're all at. Here's what folks are working on and some kind of context setting. And if yeah. you want to end it with five or 10 minutes of just okay, how far do we get? What do we need to, when do we need the next burst or things like that? Great. Yeah, yeah. But the vast majority of the time is just independent work time or time when we can collaborate without the lag of asynchronous uh, communication. So I love that. Mm. I think more opportunities to do communication bursts is something a lot of teams should be looking into. Yeah, I love that too. And I mean, I think we had um, Naomi Teitelman on a couple of, I don't know, a couple of sessions ago, and we were talking about the hybrid world of work. Yeah. And it really was making me think a lot about, you know, what we've gone, we've gone from, you know, this analog way of all being in person, and then now we're in, you know, digital, but not really. And so what we need to do is integrate the two. And it, I mean, for me, and listening to this, it's like, we need new methods yeah. and new ways and new ways of leveraging technology and all of those kinds of things to make it um, more um, fluid than it is right now, because it feels like we're, we're still uh, 
it's like, I don't know, it's like having a car, but having a horse pull it or something. Yeah. You know I mean? It's like, pretty clunky right now. Very clunky, clunky right now. Very yeah. clunky. And so as you're talking, the, the other thing that it makes me think about a little bit is this, this whole, all these pieces, you know, meetings, communication is really um, a lot of the things we've embedded in our culture, like the way we work. And I know when you and I chatted like a, a little while ago, we were talking, I was sharing with you that you know, I have some clients that are very anxious to get back in the office because they feel like they're losing their culture. And I know we had a little chuckle about that. Um, so talk to me about your views on um, how you think remote work is affecting company culture. And um, yeah, uh, it, it was funny because it, I was having the conversation with somebody in a professional services firm and they were so worried about, you know, onboarding new people and they yeah. won't, they won't know our culture. And yeah, I, I just, thankfully, it's a, a great person um, who I can speak candidly with. And I just laughed. I said, oh no, honey, they're going to know exactly what your culture is. <laughs> what you won't have is the chance to pretend your culture is something different right. with all the trappings of a gorgeous office and free yeah. breakfast or a foosball table. So uh, I think these are the moments where we really find out what the culture is, as opposed to this, uh, you know, other view, which is, you know, how do we, how do we have a culture during these times? So what people pay attention to, what rules they follow, which rules they ignore, well, that's culture. And that's yeah. going to be very clear in this kind of a world, um, you know, how people connect, how they help one another, how, you know, all of those values-based things those are going to be extremely apparent right now. So uh, virtual is is not a challenge for true culture, but yeah. it's, it's a real challenge for uh, lipstick on a pig culture. <laughs> so so um, yeah, so I, I just really encourage people to think about what matters in the organization and how are you demonstrating it? So for example, there was a great study that came out at the beginning of the pandemic because the U.S. Patents Office had been doing a work productivity study before the pandemic started. And mm -hmm. then they got to just continue it as everybody had to work from home. So mm -hmm. they had amazing data, pre and post data. And it showed that productivity went up 13% post pandemic. Wow amazing except only four percent of that was actual increase in productivity because of fewer distractions and things like that nine percent was because people were working more hours oh. so so many calls i'm on the senior leaders are just so pleased at how many more hours people are working they're so pleased that you know i got this email at 10 o'clock on a thursday night that never would have happened before and you're like Okay, you're showing your culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say it's like, so not sustainable. Like, I mean, I right. I think what's interesting, what what's coming up for me as we're talking is, you know, it's the evolution of of leadership. What's you know, what kind of leaders, you know, what is what is successful leadership going to look like in the yeah. hybrid world? Because yeah. I what I'm seeing is the companies that are struggling the most that I see are very, you know, hey, drivers, results, you know, task focused, efficiency, all of those kinds of things. And yet, you know, the disengagement in their employee groups, the, the struggles that people are having within those work cultures are spiking right now um, because there's, there's just seems to be a huge disconnect. I'm finding a very big, big disconnect between the executive level in some companies, not in all, but in some companies and the people in the middle that are, let's face it, doing the bulk of the work, right? Yeah, it's interesting because I had a positive uh, opposite side of the spectrum this morning. So I was on with the national executive directors uh, from a whole bunch of countries around the world from a giant global NGO. Mm. And they were talking about how much their productivity went up because their team was so invested in their work and so mm. uh, committed to making sure the pandemic didn't hurt their cause. And so it was so nice to hear a story where the, the productivity was really about meaningfulness. And mm -hmm. back to our uh, conversation we we're having about the meaningfulness of work. Mm -hmm. If your productivity goes up because you're not commuting, you have more time to do this work that you care passionately about, okay. 
but the drivers that I'm just doing these tasks, pushing paper, creating reports, and I'm not really sure who uses them for what, mm. that is such a disconnect. And I, yeah. I had another organization where they were talking about sending out a message around, make sure to take a day off on the Easter weekend. It's like, here we have a three-day weekend. Please be sure to at least take one day off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> just like, really? <laughs> You're going to say that? Cause that's not going to, that's not going to sound so good. Right. So, um, there is a huge disconnect and, and some of it is just work is more central to some people at the top. They, they live and breathe their work and they love that they can do it more now. Yeah. Uh, just remembering that not everyone has work be such a central part of their life. Some of it is that leaders are at a different age and stage. So yeah. if your kids are grown, if you've got somebody in your home full-time caring for your kids, so you can have an office with a door, uh, you know, great. I'm glad it's going well for you. Mm -hmm. It's not that for so many people. So uh, there is a big disconnect right now. I think it's, it, it comes from a whole variety of different reasons, but a reminder to leaders to lead, you know, to where people are not from where you are. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think a lot of leaders are really out of touch with. And that's the other thing is get good data sources, find the people who you will get some honest answers from, because I will guarantee you that the organization is telling you what you want to hear. You are probably in some kind of a strange reality bubble where you're not hearing about people's struggles, even if you care and even if you ask. So you're going to have to be a little more creative about your sources of intel to find out what's, what's really going on in your organization. But just take it as a given that you're probably pretty out of touch. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's I, I think that's such great um, advice, and I think that, and I think the other thing I noticed too, because we do uh, we do a lot of motivational uh, work with some of these senior teams, and I find that you know like there's a common energy which is around endurance and winning, and you know like just this kind of like as my my colleague Leah would say, elbow crawling through. So the pandemic's been freaking awesome. Like, this has just been like, how are we going to overcome this mountain? And to your point, like, not everybody's juiced by that, right? Right. Um, it helps. Exactly. So, yeah. okay, folks, now is the time to ask your questions. If you've got questions for Leanne, get them in there. We're in the home stretch on this one. Um, I'm curious, uh, like we talked a little bit before about the difference between people who are managing process right now and leading through this. Oh, I love like, that question. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about that. Yeah. So, you know, I don't even remember where I saw it, but mm. I saw this great definition of management as optimizing the status quo mm. and leadership is changing the status quo. Right. And boy, that, you know, bowl me over with a feather after yeah. hearing that. And yeah. I cannot tell you how often that helps me talk with people about what they're doing. Yeah. And so many people, we, I think we got to this point where it was all in this political correct BS of, you know, saying somebody was a good manager was, you know, condescending or something. Yeah. Somehow management was bad yeah, yeah. and leadership was just like management for grownups. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. But um, along with the word strategic and all these other, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, things that make me nuts. Um, so management is not leadership. They are not the same thing. And we want both from, you know, many, many different levels of the organization. So managing is optimizing the status quo. It's mm -hmm. taking the world we have. It's, you know, taking the strengths and weaknesses of our organization and making the kind of changes that allow us to do well, as well as possible in this world. That is not leadership. Right. <laughs> leadership is not about the present. Leadership is about what's coming, what's emerging, what's next. Leadership verbs, you know, anticipate, envision. <laughs> it is very different verbs than, you know, synchronize, orchestrate, optimize, which are management verbs. So it's so important that you understand 
you know, when are we doing each? Mm -hmm. Are we making sure that we've got both? So uh, I've built out and I published it on Harvard Business Review, this structure for optimal meetings and, and how do we have two different meetings. So uh, an operations meeting where we're working in the business. And, and mm -hmm. in some cases, that's not even managing, that's just producing yeah. so our producing meeting. How do we differentiate that from what I call the business builder meeting, which is that management meeting where we increase the capability, the capacity, the resilience, or the agility <sighs> of the business we have today. Mm -hmm. That's great management stuff. But how do we not mush that and mush that with the strategic meeting, which is about thinking much more externally, much longer term, and, and making those big choices and figuring out what are the imperatives for our business for the next era. So mm -hmm. getting clear on the difference between management and leadership is so important. And what's interesting is I've had a few uh, leadership teams lately where you know, I've really seen them doing a lot of management. And then interestingly, uh, their, when I look at it, their, their name is something like senior management team or senior mm. management committee or the, right. Yeah. And all of a sudden you go, Oh, that's so interesting. Cause they probably don't even notice that that's their name or that their name yeah. is different, but even their name says that they are just managing what is yeah, as opposed to leading what could be. So it's, I think one of the most exciting and interesting things for leaders to think about in their own lives, what is my role in producing? What is my role in managing? And what is my role in leading? And how do I not pretend that I'm doing one when I'm doing the other? And there certainly are some leaders who are terrible managers. <laughs> so yeah. it goes both directions, but understanding what do we need? What's fit for purpose for what situations? And let's stop muddying the two because mm -hmm. they are different. Let's stop putting them in the same meeting because our brains are not good at shifting gears from one of those modalities to the other. So it's a really fun topic for me lately, getting much mm -hmm. more clear on managers optimize the status quo and leaders change it. Yeah. And I, I, I think about, you know, so many um, companies that I've worked with over the years, when I ask them about their cadence around strategy, they have their annual offsite, strategic offsite, two-day strategic offsite, and that's it. I go, well, do you do quarterly reviews? Like, do you readjust? Do you realign? Like, do you, are you, and I think your point about, you know, they'll, they'll have strategic things on the agenda item, but they never get to them because they're so buried in their operations conversations, right? If you start a conversation with operational, you will not get to strategic. You'll never get And there. if you get to that agenda item, you'll just turn it into an operational issue. The yeah. brain does not make the jump to warp speed yeah. in one meeting. It just doesn't. Yeah. Uh, we had one team that just because of, they were geographically dispersed and they had to come together from different parts of the world to meet. So they had to have those two meetings back to back. So mm. we just scheduled them in different parts of the building. Like yeah, they literally smart. physically got up and moved to a different room because yeah. the different room, at least a small signal to the brain that, yeah. you know, that it's a different question. Well, it's funny because these things are like little hacks, right? And sometimes they sound too simple. Like you're like, really just, you know, shift, shift rooms and start talking about strategy over ops. But it is, it's so true. Like we can, we can hack a lot of these things for ourselves. It doesn't have to be it's a pandemic. I'm now at the point where I have, um, I have the one side of my couch where I watch movies and read and the one side of my couch where I nap because if I try to read, like I was confusing the two. And yeah, so I know I need, I, I literally, it's like a, the couch has a chaise thing. So if yeah. I'm sitting in the chaise direction, that's to be alert and awake and read and yeah. going the long couch way. That's like, it's okay. You can fall asleep now. <laughs> My brain was like, I was trying to read a book and I was falling asleep after five pages. So like, it's not silly. It's how yeah. your brain works. Our brains yeah. are so aware of the situation around us. We yeah. train our brains in the most incredible ways. So yeah. find the physical cues to tell you what mode you need to be in. And if you yeah. have a more, and in the more strategic room, you want like cool quotes on the walls. You want, you know, whiteboards everywhere in the management meeting and just put a screen and type stuff onto the screen and off you go. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it should feel very different. I love it. I got a question. 
Yeah, I it. love it. Yes. Well, I saw the neatest question come in. She says um, that in one of your videos, you talked about conflict and made the point that the point of teams is conflict. Getting diverse perspectives requires comfort with disagreeing. So tell us more about making this real with teams as they form. And I'm going to add a layer and tell us how to do this with teams that are onboarding and they have a mentor okay. like Kenzie, who's helping us today. We've never physically met. She joined the team a couple of months ago. Yeah. I probably pass her on the street and we we may not recognize each other because we've only ever seen each other on zoom so yeah if your eyes that. were down to somebody's bottom half you totally wouldn't recognize yeah. it. this is all i got yeah, it's the um, <laughs> okay fantastic question vanita and yes i always talk about conflict is a feature not a bug in team mm -hmm. it's the point so I do a very simple exercise. And in the book, there's a long story about where the exercise comes from. It's called the tarp. It's based on the Love idea the of trying to spread out a plastic tarpaulin over a tent <laughs> to protect it from the rain and how different people on the different ropes are pulling in different directions. So it was a metaphor to get away from this rowing metaphor where we're constantly talking about good team players pull in the same direction, which is a very anti-conflict message and mm. one that we have to eradicate. So just imagine four people each holding a rope on the corner of a big plastic tarp and trying to pull it so that it's tight and the rain will roll off, but get it kind of centered so that the rain, you know, doesn't hit the tent. So this is the exercise we do. So you take for your team. So this can be a new team or an existing team. And for every member of the team, not the team leader, but for every member, you can draw the picture and put a rope for each. So if you have eight members of the team, one is the team leader, put seven ropes. And I want you to answer these three questions for each person. So for the first question is, what's the unique value of your role on this team? What expertise, what knowledge, what experience, what are your superpowers? So if you have finance, their superpowers are going to be around analytics, right? And they're going to really be looking at budgets and capital and, you know, they've got lots of superpowers. That's the first question. What's the unique value of that role? Second question, what are the stakeholders that that role is thinking about advocating for more than anyone else on the team? And that's a really fun exercise when you realize how, oh, we actually have very different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the difference between a consumer and a buyer, you know, lots of companies, your consumer is not your buyer. If you uh -huh. sell pet food, for example. Um, but the buyer, the person who walks down the grocery store aisles and picks something off the shelves is not the grocery store category manager who decides whether they put your stuff on the shelves or not. And the category manager is different from the procurement people and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So second question, what's the unique stakeholder that that role is thinking about? And the third question, what's the tension you're obligated to put on discussions? And I just use adjectives for this. Is it viable? Is it compelling? Is it scalable? Is it, and it's absolutely amazing. If you go around and ask those three questions for every role on your team, suddenly people have way more empathy, way more of a sense of what they're obliged to do. How, if I stop pulling on that rope, no one else is pulling on it. My stakeholder is not going to be represented or this way of thinking about the problem. I'm going to leave a risk here if I don't raise that. So all of a sudden productive tensions become not only the norm, but my obligation. Mm -hmm. And I stop interpreting those tensions, those, oh, that yanking that happens sometimes, I stop interpreting it as friction. So it's not that somebody's a jerk and they're trying to wear me down. It's that we have scarce resources and we got to make them go as far as possible. So we need everybody stretching them as far mm -hmm. as they can. And that one exercise it changes everything. It's there's full instructions in the good fight. Um, but you know, it is crazy how much, uh, it changes your mindset around conflict and that's the flossing. So if we go back to that metaphor of, we don't want conflict to be root canals, we want it to be flossing. Then what you're doing is every time you're making a decision, the tarp owner or the decision maker is saying, okay, we haven't heard this perspective yet. 
how is your stakeholder thinking about that? Or, you know, I don't think we've put enough tension yet on the idea of how scalable this is. You know, can you talk a little bit? So you're actually making it a habit mm -hmm. to get these different perspectives. So um, thank you for asking, Vanita. It is, uh, it's an amazing exercise and it creates such a change in how your team can, can have conflict. If you do it from the very beginning, it will just be normal to the team. Well, I love that. And I, I, the TARP exercise was absolutely one of the biggest takeaways I had from your book. And, and I have to say to everybody listening, it, you know, because one of the things that I took for granted or I hadn't really thought about was the fact that people have different stakeholders. You know, the person in finance versus the person, in, I mean, I've been in sales. So, you know, sales and finance, like, I mean, we love butting heads, sales and marketing, <laughs> right? Like, you know, sales and everybody loves butting heads. I was going to say sales and ops <laughs> is always my favorite example, but yeah. Yeah. And so when you, I think that idea of building compassion and empathy, um, which, you know, there's so much work uh, that's being and talk that's happening around psychological safety and the importance of that. And I think, and I think these sorts of exercises contribute to that. They create the container for people to be more candid and, and have more meaningful conversations without with it being productive tension as opposed to unproductive tension, because we realize, okay, we're all pulling, but for the same purpose, but might have yeah. different kind of motivators. Yeah. Behind. So tension is good. We want all the tension we can get. We want to mm. minimize the friction. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that's wearing us down. It is, it's just, and just think about, you know, it's just what, you know, really ruins something is yeah. that friction, right? <laughs> um, so that's a really, really important idea. Tension's going to make things bigger and that's okay. And it's not, it's still not comfortable mm. for sure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're not being paid to do things that are easy, but it's so much different than interpreting it as, well, this person's you know, you know, giving me a hard time or doesn't like my ideas. No, it has nothing to do with not liking your ideas. It has to do with it. When you look at the issue with different expertise or through a different stakeholder lens, and when you put the tension on it, you need to about, is this viable or is it mm. ethical or is it yeah. um, that, you know, you see the issue differently and that's a positive thing. 100%. Well, Leanne, thank you for spending your time with us today. As always, I've taken nuggets, um, so many nuggets down. So I'm going to be pulling my thoughts together in a recap <laughs> for everybody. But such so great to, uh, to just chat with you. So thanks for being so here. So fun. And it was so nice to be with you, Glyne. And yeah. uh, it's always nice to be with you. We don't normally have an audience for our shenanigans. <laughs> It was kind of fun. I know this is like literally you guys have been like sitting in on the Glyne and Leanne show of uh, <laughs> what we like to chit chat about. All right. So to wrap this up um, for today, for those of you who don't know about the round table, um, if you're new to us, we are a group coaching company and uh, we do group coaching, group mentoring, and we do do team coaching as well. So we're all about the collective. I'm a big fan of the collective like Leanne. Um, so feel free to reach out if we can help you at all. Um, like Leanne, I wrote a book called The Grassroots Leadership Revolution and uh, it's coming out on ebook. So this is just getting released on the ebook right now. So uh, if you haven't picked it up, this is how you can start your own peer community and uh, navigate leadership without trying to go it alone. And so next up, we have Dov Barron, who is probably one of the most interesting people I met. I was sharing with Leanne, I was on Dov's podcast uh, a couple of months ago, and I was so terrified about it because he's super, he's super hardcore about his podcast, but I survived and I'm going to turn the tables on him. We're going to talk all about his, uh, he's had many, many adventures in leadership and um, I, it's going to be an amazing conversation. So hope you guys will join us May 11th, um, but have a great rest of the week. Get yourself vaccinated if you can. Leanne, great to see you and thanks everybody for tuning in and thank you, Kenzie, for um, all of your technical support today. <laughs> it's funny having a colleague that I haven't met in person, I have to say. <laughs> it really is.